He was called and forgave them for betraying him. He asked him three times, Peter, do you really love me? And of course, by the, by the second time, Peter was a little bit hurt. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. But what we don't know is that Jesus was trying for Peter to really think about what was his assignment. Because he said, every time he, he responded, he said, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus would say, feed my lion. Feed my sheep. But do you know exactly what Jesus was trying to really get Peter to understand? Just, Peter, I have an assignment for you. I have something for you to do. But I want you to look deep into your heart and find out why you will go and feed my sheep. What's the motivation behind the feeding? Only if I love and I get to <coughs> Love comes first. And like I said, I wasn't even trying to do any of this. I was doing. But it was what compelled me. It kept whatever he told me later to add to the message was based on my love for him. It may not be perfect. I'm still trying to let him let him conform me into his image. We all are like that, under construction. And then that other song, I got acquainted with it back in December when I watched on TV uh, the, the Dolly Parton show when I didn't know how invested she was really in the things of God until I watched it. And she sang that song with Zach Williams about there was Jesus. Oh my God. You know, it doesn't matter what you're going through. You never go alone. You never walk alone. Many people say, that's a promise. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Jesus does not lie. He is not a man that he should lie, and he is not the son of man that he should repeat. He loves, period. It doesn't matter what right. you've done, where you've been, he loves you. And I found I find it a little bit kind of weird because as I was studying, I thought, Lord, nobody ever has questions. We do all the time when we are going through something. We question God. Why this? Why that? Do, have you ever stopped and think a little bit about God exercising his prerogative of uh, uh, his sovereignty? He exercised that with the life of Jesus. Now, we know Jesus gave his life willingly. Nobody had to make him do it. But God killed Jesus. Have you ever really thought about that? Have you ever questioned? But then we think we have the right to ask God, why are you allowing me to go through this? And this is what I want to talk a little bit to begin with. We are all going through something. Everybody Especially after uh, COVID, everything is shaken. Everything is being shaken. And the word of God is true because he, he, he says it in the book of Hebrews and Haggai. Once more, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Everything, let me tell you, everything that can be shaken will be shaken and is being shaken. Mm-hmm. So it's in you, if there's anything. I want to talk a little bit first about God's sovereignty, and then I'll go into something that's not going to take that long, but there is something I would like to either plant in your ears or water if you've ever, if you've ever heard it before, because only God has can, can give the increase. But <clears throat> he has the prerogative. He has the right. He made us. He bought us. 
because you own something, so do not do whatever you want with it. So how is it that I turn and I look at God and I ask God, why God? And I'm not saying you're not supposed to. That's not what I'm saying. Because we can ask him. It's up to him whether or not he answers. Mm -hmm. But we can ask. But he is sovereign. God's sovereignty is defined as God's unlimited power and control over the affairs of nature and history. Period. There's not semicolon or no, period. He has the he has the right to do whatever he wants to. And I don't know why, but it 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 really grasp you know, grasped me. It really touched my heart when I was reading about the three Hebrew children because this is what they told Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Misha, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God, see this is confidence. This is trust. This is knowing the God you serve can do anything and you can stand on it and say it no matter what. So they just look at King and the master and say, the God we serve is able to believe us. And he will deliver us from your from your majestic hand. But even if he doesn't, hmm. even if he doesn't, we want you to know <clears throat> your majesty, you know, with all reverent things. He was very reverent. He was a king. Your majesty, we will not serve you God. Or worship the image of gold you have set up. We are we refuse to come from on And then I started looking at things differently. All of a sudden, he is so different. Let us go to the other side. They didn't know what 
was going to happen before they got to the other side. But but I will submit to you that Jesus was already telling them the game. the scriptures, then we will see and we will be encouraged. So he already told them, let us go. And then the thing that I like the most is that he didn't send them alone. He got into the boat with them. So he got on the boat. Of course, he went to sleep. And then the storm came. And of course, it, it had to be some kind of storm. Let us not make it little. It had to be some kind of storm that made us so afraid because these were people that were accustomed to this kind of storm. But they were so afraid all of a sudden and they they woke him up because he, Jesus, don't you care? I found out this time around when I read that scripture that storms in our lives come for a purpose. See, always remember that God is a God of purpose. When I'm going through something, I have to repeat it time and time again. God has a purpose. God has a plan. He has a plan to give us life. He has a plan to, to, to give us a future and a hope. He has a plan. Even though I know I may not know the plan, he has the plan. He may let me know if I'm if I confident. But he has a plan. So what happens? He had a purpose. The shakings in our lives, first of all, is to show us, to identify what problem do you have in your life? That's one of the first things you can look at in this passage. Because Jesus, immediately after he touched, the storm had to hush when he, when he told him, be, 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 be still. And then, what did he tell him about it? Oh, Jesus, little faith. Where is your faith? Wow. And he wasn't really saying you don't have faith, but because if you go to Matthew, when he's talking about the faith of a mustard seed, everybody has a measure of faith. Everybody. That's what the Word of God says. It may be little, but you have it. You have what you need. The thing they failed to understand was that Jesus was trying to tell them, your faith your faith needs to Grow. Because when he gave them the example about the mustard seed, he, he gave them the small, the smallest seed. But then he said, but it grows into a big tiny, and everybody can go on to it and benefit from it. So, what was his point right there? That your faith needs to grow. It cannot stay as little as the as mustard seed anymore. He expects that faith to grow until it gets to that place of where well, everybody can find uh, peace and solace on the back line. But it has to grow. So the disciples have a problem now. This, this, this faith they had, they have to allow Jesus to increase it because it's not for the storms that we are actually facing nowadays, we're going to need that faith to grow a little bit. It's not going to do it. What you had yesterday is not going to help you uh, tomorrow. And I want to say this. You know, when, especially when the pandemic hits, one of the things that I heard in Christian uh, places that they all had in common was God was doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. Okay, if we really believe that God is doing a new thing, first of all, in this in this new era that we are living, we must keep prophesying. The word of God, I'm not saying it. God spoke the world into existence. 
do you know that you have the same power, the same creative power that you inside of us to speak the word? Because that's all he did. He spoke the word, and the word started forming. So we have that same power. It comes from him. So if we believe that God is doing a new thing, and the old has to go, and the new has to come in, then inevitably, God is talking about change. Something's got to be, something's got to change. If you want to join this movement of the new thing, then you have got to change. Something in your life is not working, so you need for God to come in and adjust it. If we are not changeable, we won't shift well. It's a new season. Your faith must increase to meet all those things that are coming. It, it makes me think about the one skin. The Jesus came with a brand new message, but the, the disciples, the people around him were still with the old thing. They didn't understand. They didn't. So he says, you, this one skin. Because see, he's interested in the one skin. He doesn't want the one thing to go to ruin. So we need that in order for it to be selfless. So because if you put the new thing into the one skin, it's in its old, it's going to burst. It's going to, you know, that's not what God wants. He wants to do it, he wants to transform us the way we think so that we can grasp and be able to grow and do what he wants us to do. So change is inevitable. Our wine can be renewing, rewetting, restoring. And it's what it says in Romans 12, right? Do not be conformed to the things of this world, but allow the Lord, the Spirit of the God, and the Spirit of the Lord to renew your mind. So that you what? You can then what is the good will of God? If we don't renew our mind, we won't be able to get the renewing comes first. God desires to use adversity for our good and his glory. After all, God made us thorns through we are. <laughs> I heard David Jeremiah say, Do not fear the shaking because it will be your main thing. <laughs> yeah. So from here I want to invite you to into my 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 then so to speak, so to speak. I have a book that I recently bought. It's a forty day devotional and God is really So I will share this with you and then I'll go to one little story in the Old Testament and then we'll close. This thing about trusting God is it, a hard thing. But as we get to know Him, because he, you, we have to get to know the Lord. Because you don't trust uh, somebody that you don't know, right? You put your trust in someone you know. So, but it is gradual. It, it takes us years and years and years to get to that place where we don't ask anymore. We don't, we just trust. We're in good hands. God loves me. There is nothing God won't do for me. He said, can you come sit here? You can come sit. I don't know. Okay, so, in order to trust God, we must always view our adverse circumstances through the eyes of faith, not of sense. It's not about how you feel. Feelings come and go. And just as the faith of salvation comes through hearing the message of the gospel, as soon as that, it's only so many different things. So the faith to trust God in adversity comes through the word of God alone. When I'm going through adversity, I have got to trust God. He's my only one. I mean, He 
Remember, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. One of my devotionals, the title is Filtered. And you know, I think about something being filtered like the, like the blind, the, the light is being coming to do the blind. When you realize that everything in your life is filtered through God, now remember that every, we don't, not none of us go through something that first does not go to God. Amen. We have, we have Job that he had no idea, but the devil and God were having a conversation and God volunteered him, gave him permission. Then we have Jesus granting permission to the devil to speak to him. It didn't just happen. God said, okay, but I will pray for you. So that his faith won't give up. But he had to go to God first. Then he grants his permission. So that alone should just encourage us. Encourage your heart that we go we go through nothing just because. No, God has a plan. God has a plan. He 
has a plan. Just right there. Has a plan. And you should find encouragement and encouragement in God alone. If nothing else, Amen. Sasha, if nothing else, just to know that God knows. He knows he's in control. He's got it. So it may not alleviate the pain because we know that God knows and because he is in control. But it will prove your faith because he'll help you keep going. He's in control, not me. He's got this. I don't care what I'm going through. God has it. God knows every detail. Life is not random. It's not without meaning. He loves us. If we go through whatever we go through, it's because it's, a, it's good for us. We need this thing. Even though you're temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials, this is no accident. It happens to prove your faith, which is infinitely more valuable than gold. That is in 1 Peter 1, 6, and 7. It is our faith that's being tested, that is put to the test. Where is your faith? That's what Jesus asked the disciples, right, sister? Oh, where is your faith? I was in the boat. See, they, Jesus was really trying to tell them, if you had come to the level of the storm, you would have been able to tell it first, and it had to obey. But he was giving them the opportunity to interact and do it because they had the power to do it. They have been with him enough. They have seen enough. And yes, he's approved it. Whatever it is that we're going through, God said, okay, you have my okay to go ahead and do this thing. And, and, but don't, don't forget that there is always a reason. Remember that God is a God of purpose. He doesn't just do because he wants to do it. Oh, just let, let Laura go through this thing just because I want to see her shape. No, there is something in Laura that needs shaking so that <laughs> her faith will stand. So that whatever it is in Laura, faith stands. The rest, Laura, don't need it. Let the space yourself, let it go. Let it go. I have a book that talks about um, about the, the, an avalanche. And in the natural, actually it says that the avalanche is, is God's way of dealing with nature to get rid of everything that's dead. Huh. So he allows that avalanche. And just imagine it. In movies we see this big ball of, of snow rolling down the mountain. You know, everywhere it goes, you know, it's crushing everything. And, and, but it's a way of cleansing so that anything that is there that they're attached to you that needs to go, it will go. So welcome the avalanches, the spiritual avalanches, because it will cleanse you. It will get rid of those things that I don't need in my life. So if we look at stuff, in that manner, through the eyes of God, this is good for me. See, Peter needed shaking. God alone knows the purpose and the plans that he has for a person. So he, he never allowed to shake it. He knew ahead of time what he wanted to do in the apostle. I want him to be my complete. We all want to work for God. Oh, we want somebody to prophesy over me. Not knowing what's going to happen. If we get that word, and with that word, God is going to mold you and fix you. So that you can actually do what he said he was going to do. So first of all, he has to do a work in you, inside of you, for 
then send you to do the work to do you. So first, inside of me, to do me, and then I can go and whatever, do whatever it is that he wants me to do. But the work needs to be done. And I, I think you, I, I was, I was reading, um, and all of a sudden I, uh, what, which one of the scriptures is it that really got me? Isaiah. The last time I spoke, I spoke a little bit about Isaiah, how God had to allow Isaiah to see himself first. He, he knew he was going to send the, the prophet to the nation, but he first allowed Isaiah to have an encounter with him. So in chapter 6 of Isaiah, we find the, the, the prophet entering the temple, and all of a sudden, I mean, the train of God filled the temple, and all of a sudden, <laughs> that's a nice thing there. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, Isaiah saw himself. And we cannot be in front of God and not be able to look at the filthiness inside of us. Right. Uh -huh. We are going to see what's inside of us. And I believe with all my heart that one of the purposes of God in allowing Isaiah, because immediately when he saw the glory of God, he said, whoa, whoa, it's me. He saw himself, the condition of his heart. I am a man of a clean lips. And so in seeing that, he said, I need help. I need somebody to clean me. And then God did. He brought the seraphim and he touched his lips and he cleansed him. But I, you know what I, I did? This time around when I was reading that scripture, what got me was I was thinking, oh my God. Not only did he need a cleansing before being sent out, but Isaiah really needed to know that when God sent him, he wasn't going to just lower the thing over the people he was going to be sent to. Come on. He had to remember, I mean, I am a man of uncleanness, and that comes with might yeah. and power. I, you know, like he was over then, he was better than then. I've never seen that before. God wanted to open his eyes to I mean, you dirty too, you know, if I had come to you, uh, you wouldn't be able to be cleansed. I did that. Mm -hmm. right. So don't go now trying to be master over anybody. They're my people. Yeah. Even when he told Peter, he said, my sheep. Peter had to know that they didn't belong to him. They were his master's sheep. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're not mine. So you, you, none of us have any right to come and talk down on anybody. Amen. You, would you like that to be done to you? Then do as you would like it to be done to you. You know, it's those very things that we rather got removed from our lives that God uses to challenge or grow or grow in our faith. To transform and perfect and perfect us into his likeness. Our pain and suffering is bringing about something far greater. The deep faith of understanding that God is always in control, that he is never almost suffering. He is always suffering. And God's sovereignty takes our faith in the deepest depths because we realize that He has the right to give life and He has the right to allow death. He can bless us with help or allow pain and suffering. He has the right to bring good into our lives or allow bad. It makes me think about Job. Job said, Are you are we supposed just to accept good and not bad from the hand of God? But the hardest part is the truth of his sovereignty is far beyond what we can comprehend or explain. And see, God owes us no explanation. Let me tell you something. As hard and as harsh as it may sound, he doesn't have to explain anything to us. And I want to read something I put here from another, another uh, devotional. 
I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. To imagine that Jesus Christ came to save and sanctify me is heresy. He came to save and sanctify me himself. Amen. To be his absolute bond slave. So completely his bond slave that when he speaks, there is no possibility of dispute. No argument. I, and this is, I got it, this is really good. I reckon on you for extreme service. This is what God is saying. I expect from Laura extreme service with no complaining on Laura's part and no explanation on Bruce's. He owes us nothing. He already gave. The work is done. He, he did everything that needed to be done. We actually have signed our rights and become bond slaves of Christ. Any fool can insist on his rights, and any devil will see that he gets them. You want to, there's so many of us that want to give somebody a piece of our mind. The place that you will end up in no mind. Let me give them a piece of my mind. God's sovereignty takes us takes our faith in the deepest debt because we realize that he has the right to give life and allow it. His ways are higher than ours. He's God, I'm not. But taking your faith deeper depends upon you. You've got to respond in faith. Every single time, no matter what your situation is, our little suffering, you've got to set aside your pain so that your vision of God is not distorted. Amen. You've got to keep living in faith, knowing that God is on his throne. You've got to set aside your fears, grab a hold of your faith, and never give up. And again, it's all a matter of perspective. How do you look at things? How do you look at life? What am I here? There's God. And that is, that is really what keeps you going. When you know that you know that whatever it is, this too shall pass. Nothing is eternal here. And also something that helps me a lot is that everything that God does, every work that he does, is with eternity in mind. Exactly. It's about what's going to happen over there. Here's where we fix it. Here's where he, yeah. he, he puts us together to make us ready for that life over there. This is eternal. Our prayers are often primarily focused on changing our circumstances. That's all we want. God, do away with this thing that I'm going through. I don't want to go through this thing. It's too hard. Uh, I've been there before. Just do it. Just take it away. When they should be off on transforming our thoughts. This is my mind. How I look at things. How I think. That's the, that's the, <coughs> that's the thing. <coughs> you need to change how you look at things. You need to change your thoughts. We want God to take away the problems of pain, sorrow, suffering, and sickness to rescue us from our troubles and trials. But what we really need is to be rescued from ourselves. We, we are the problem if we are, if we are honest. It is what is deep within the matter deep within that matters the most is where we must focus in order to change our faith deeper so that it will grow. Within ourselves, within us is where we truly need help. We truly become enslaved to our thoughts. It's the really mm -hmm. thing that enslaves us. We look at a situation and I change this or that yeah. without even consulting the word. God, look at this, what's going on. We don't have 
I don't know what God will do. You know, you go to the scripture, you'll find out what he thinks about the, the situation you are in. So it is vital that you focus upon what you think to be attention, everything, and hear it twice. Because the thoughts, the way I look at things, my thoughts control me. Yes, yes. God tells us directly yes. as the man thinks, so is he. Our thoughts control our attitudes and decisions and ultimately our faith. You know, that it's up to me to forgive. No. Forgiveness is it's something I decide. It's a decision. I am going to line up with what the word says and I'm going to forgive. No matter what this brother is doing to me, I'm going to forgive. Why is it back to work? I'm not basing it on my emotions. If I base it on my emotions, I won't forgive. Because it hurt. I'm not going to forgive it. It was too, it was too bad what they did to me. upset about me. I'm not going to forgive. But it is a decision, brothers and sisters, that you have got to make. No, it's, a, it's another thing. It's a decision. I'm going to love my God with yes, all yes. that I have. Yes, it doesn't matter what I, if he did or not. Yes. 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 I'm going to love. You yes. have to make up yes. your mind about doing and lining, lining up your <laughs> thoughts and your actions yes. with what God says the Word of God, not yes. what I think. Yes. Yes. If you go to the Word and you will find the answers. Yes. The, the Bible tells me that when I know the truth, the truth will set me free. Yes. And, it, it, and, and I tell you, it's not just the truth. It is the truth that you know. You have got to know it for yourself. Because if you don't know it, then there'll be no no freedom. You have to get to know the truth. We rather we rather be right about a situation than do right. Whatever, and and you're in big trouble. Let me tell you. First things first. We've got to think about what we're thinking about, being fully conscious of our our thoughts, and then we have to take a good look at what we're focusing on and see if it matches. If I say, if I don't say anything else, get a hold of this part. We have to take a look at what we're focusing on and see if it matches. Oh, does God stop in the Word? Yes. You right. go to the Word. Yes. I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that. The answer is in the Word. You go to God. He will clarify. He will bring, he will bring clarity yes. to you.
everyone who was suffering hardship and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. There were about 400 men with him. Okay. I will start with uh, saying again, repeating myself, when I said that we all want a word. We all want a word. I want to hear a word from God. Not knowing that, you know, what's going to come with that word. Uh, you have to be conformed to that, <laughs> into that word before you go and share the word. Because that word needs to do a work inside of you in order for you to come and share it with others right. and, and become part of your life so that when you actually share the word, it will become life to your hearers. So we shouldn't be so so quick to God just come and say something because we don't know what that word that I so desire is going to do to me first before it can go through me so that it can reach others. David had a word already. David had probably been anointed already when he got to this place. He found himself in the in the cave of Adullam. David had already probably been anointed at least three times to become king of Israel. So he had the word. He had a word already. Little did he know, because this was the king. This is the, the authority, the, the, the supreme person in a, in a country. He's after David. He wants to kill him. But David had a word. Hey, you got a word, Pastor. You got a word. You got a word. Hang on to the word. So he had this word that he was going to become king. Yet he finds himself where? In the weirdest place of all of them, in a cave, in a cave where it's dark. And not just dark, but it's probably in again again because I thought about Jesus Jesus and I don't know for sure I didn't really study it I didn't look for it um, I didn't research it is what I'm trying to say but I have two thoughts one thought really um, Judas one of the twelve betrayed him and then I, I'm not sure if, if it was the same day that then Peter said I don't know him And then one of the twelve, and then one of the inner circle, the ones that the closest to Jesus said, I don't know. How would you feel that two of your best friends in one day betrayed you? That's the ultimate thing, you know. So it's the same thing. It's on my heart, I'm going to tell you to say it's on my heart. That it hurts, it hurts deeply, it hurts God, it hurts the people of God.
are saying things, whether they're right or wrong, but they're still talking about me. This is why we do not go by what we feel. No, God said something. And I'm going to hang on to the word of God because he doesn't lie. And he never shows up late. He is always on time. So, yeah, he called, so he got, he I know the word for her. But I know it by heart. The word means, uh, what is the word that, uh, oh God, help me here. Bitter. The word in Hebrew for discontented is bitter. Bitter. Immediately when I heard that, what I thought was some months ago I shared about Amen. 
And I knew the word was for somebody because I swear I did just have it seven times for him. The word was. But he had me get up from my bed. I was in bed already. And he said, you need to get up and find out about Abram and what he does. And this is where he took him up to you. Even in my paper, and when I came that Sunday, I'm mean, worshiping over there in the back. And this is how much it was open to me about what I was expecting to have. So, what I found out about this is that uh, there, there's the sycamore tree, and I found out that the sycamore tree, tree, unlike the fig tree, is bitter, it's a bitter fruit. So the job of uh, Abram was to how on earth to do all the things that the job of the Lord was to do on earth to do the things that the Lord had to do. And he had this magic word. So he had about four days prior to the harvest, he had to come and take care of this big tree and show it. going to bring sweetness into your life. I'm going to take away the bitterness and I'm going to give you sweetness. But in order for me to do that, there is a transaction that has to take place. I have got to cut you. So how many of us will volunteer for that? One thing too. Oh, look at it. It's in the bottom. See, God will open my eyes anyway. It's in the bottom where it says that I learned that the word discontent is bitter. But um, in Isaiah 58, verses 9 and 10, I'm going to read it. And it's, it, this is in relation to David being in the dark in this cave, running for his life, I, I remind you, because somebody was after his life. They wanted to kill him. Word. It's not a word. <laughs> it doesn't matter how dark it gets. I'll tell you, this, this will encourage you. 
it says in Isaiah 58, 9 and 10, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, and we know that this is the chapter about fasting because God was mad at them because they were saying they were fasting and they were, they had an attitude themselves, even attitude. We're talking about the darkness. It says here, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, oppressing one another, talking about one another, gossiping, if I have ever heard a word that has made me think about the body of Christ, it's this. Gossiping and talking about one another and without any dis without any kind of respect. First of all, for God, and then for your fellow brothers and sisters. I'm going to tell you something before I end this. When I was reading, I, I really, you see, God has a way of giving you everything. I mean, I just was so open. Okay. him completely after what he came to his senses. See, God had to put him in that place where he saw him. Well, he came to his senses and realized, I have got to go back to help and get my father uh, out and ask God for forgiveness. Because see, we don't, this is one thing that it gets to me, it gets to me when we're doing hurting one another. We don't ever think that because I'm hurting too many it's God who I am coming against. And what did God tell uh, uh, Peter? Did he tell told Peter, not Peter, Paul? It's hard to, to speak against this. You're hurting yourself. So it was, again, and he said it in that order. I have, I have, uh, uh, again, seven minutes of my father. And I have got to go back and make it right. And see, God gave him everything back. Every, every bit of what he, he lost. And he was able to do that in the life. That was just for him. That would be another time. He restored him. Yes. He restored him. Yes. He restored him. Do you know what the signal is? The same is when from, from just a child of God, you're becoming a son of God. Mm -hmm. And all of us are sons, by the way. Yes. But it's when, we because it's a positional thing. So just like the, uh, 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 in John 15, you remain in me, you abide in me. The branches, do not give the fruit. They go through Jesus and then through us, and then the fruit comes. It's coming from him, not from me. Yeah. But, so, anyway, I said what I 
When you become a son, it's what happened to the prodigal son. He gave him that secret name. He had all the authority. All the authority of heaven was backing him up. He could go and represent, see, and you look at it from the perspective of God. He had all the authority to represent his daddy. At the affairs of the, all the money he had, all the assets, go pay the, the debtors, go. And then when you come to the senses and realize that it's messed up and came back, see, we don't want to say I'm sorry. We do not want to say sorry. But when he did, he came and he was killed every single time. He said, I want to talk to the to the son that stayed. This time around, I want to look at him and I'm going to talk to him. Because he, and this is how he likened it to me was the one left and, and spent the money and did whatever, but he came back and asked for forgiveness and he was restored. The other one, this is the one that comes to church every Sunday, even now. Every time the doors of the, the church are open, there, there, there he is, there she is. But they had an attitude. Mm. This son wasn't happy with his brother returning. Who on earth was what is that? Where's the love? My brother came back. He was lost, now he's found. Yeah. Why? Why am I gonna get mad at God because he's you know, putting him back together again, restoring him? So he got mad and he, he, he didn't want to participate of the of the peace the father was doing for his brother and then the father had to tell him, son, peace to the body. I want to talk to the body for a minute. The one that comes to church every Sunday. That may have an attitude about what's going on in church and how the thing the affairs of the church are being handled. I don't like it. But they're but they're here. And, and, and they're not accepting that. They're not happy. But, but they're here, but have an attitude, and they, they are judging. God says, if you judge, you will be judged in the same manner. But How there? How there? I judge thinking that nothing is going to come back to me. Everything that I do will come back to me. Everything that God cannot be mocked, that's the word. If I do something, if I plant something, expect that it's coming back to me. We don't know when. Right. And it's not just that thing that you did, but more, more, and the same thing and more. Can you handle that? So, He said, look at the church right now. The ones that are saying that they're, they, you know, they didn't go away and they didn't spend my money or anything. They're here with, you know, with their halos of, uh, around their head, being, being so good. But they have, he has something against them. Mercy Lord. He has something against them. They really sit in there like, God done nothing. I'm okay. I'm free from sin. And he says, I have this thing against you. And you need to make it right. You need to make it right. Because if I want to be blessed, you know, this brother had a problem. I am not happy, Pastor, that you are uh, uh, entertaining this other sister or brother. You're just loving on them. Um, I have a problem with that. I want you to fix it. 
I want to just do something about it to make me happy. Uh, yes. And, and, and the father said, son, see, the point here is that he was all along in his father's house, coming in and out, having the same uh, uh, privileges and benefits of the father in his household, but he wasn't Because he said, You never threw away a party for me. And he said, Son, how could you not be happy? This son of mine was lost and now he's back. He's been found. This is time for celebration. Mm -hmm. Rather than to throw a stick or a stone, whoa, you went and did whatever. Forgiveness, where is the forgiveness? So he said, Son, everything that I have. It is our your is at your disposal. So then my question to you all today is how is it and why is it that you're not partaking of all the goodness of God? Lord. Why? Lord. Oh, and I'm gonna close this thing. We don't we don't wanna respect God's sovereignty. Like I said, if you if you want this so this word, we all have promises from God. If you want this promise, then bear in mind that a word is going to be done inside of you before you can go and share that word so that it can become you know, bread for others, life for others. It has to work. It has to do a work inside of you. Um Do not, do not be misled. Right now, it doesn't look so good. Right now, it looks like David is in charge of a bunch of misfits that are angry and dead. In. But it's going to get better. David had a word from God. And make no mistake, the changes that God is doing in our lives, they have eternal value. And God does not lie. He will have a glorious church. It's up to you if you want to be a part of the bride. But God will have this bride without wrinkle for his second coming. Oh, oh. oh. What are you going to do with it?